All right, welcome everybody. It's Friday afternoon and we are picking up testimony on H329, which is an act relating to amending the prohibitions against discrimination. We have taken testimony on this starting in January. And with us today, I asked Bo Yang and Julio Thompson to come back to testify on this. They testified on the first day that we took um, testimony on that. And so if, um, or are you here? I see Julio. Hi. Um, I suppose I have to go hi so you can see <laughs> us who's talking. Um, so I assume that you've been following along the testimony that we've heard for the last couple of weeks here and there. And I just wanted to come back because your presentations were very thorough and you know, under other circumstances, we'd say, sure, let's vote for it today. Um, but we've taken testimony from from that have provided different different views, and I just wanted to come back so that we could hear from you again what what the intent of the bills are and why it was constructed the way it was constructed. We've heard about McDonald Douglas. We've heard about um, severe or pervasive, severe and pervasive, severe and or pervasive. You know, just we've heard a lot of different things that have that have. Um, so I want to return to the original context before we start marking up the bill. And so um, I just like to start with Bohr and, um, and then we'll come back to Julio after that and we'll have questions. So welcome back, Bohr. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me back. Uh, just for the record, Bohr Yang, Executive Director and Legal Counsel for the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And I... Um, do want to thank all of you for inviting me back to testify in this bill. I have been following the testimony. Um, and I think the thing that I want to address first and foremost is probably the most important part of this bill, and that is addressing the severe or pervasive standard that has been used by courts to analyze hostile work, hostile school, and hostile housing environments. Um, as I shared in my first testimony, this standard has become impossible to me and no longer reflects what your average person would consider a hostile work or a hostile school or a hostile housing environment. I shared stories of women being subjected to unwelcome touches by their supervisors and coworkers and the courts finding that it's not severe because uh, they were unable to show that it had an impact on their performance on the job. I shared stories of women being subjected to weekly comments about their bodies and sexual innuendos and the court finding that it was not sufficiently pervasive because it had just not occurred frequently enough. The severe or pervasive standard is both confusing and too great a burden to bear. Yes, there have been a few courts that have adopted an even stricter standard called severe and pervasive. Um, those courts require that a hostile behavior be both sufficiently severe and pervasive enough. But that is the minority of courts. That is not the current legal standard. The current legal standard is severe or pervasive. And it is not necessary for this committee or the legislature to clarify that the standard is uh, not severe and pervasive, but instead severe or pervasive. Keeping the word and between severe and pervasive in this bill, because currently the bill by mistake has the word and in it, keeping that word in here would mean that the committee only intends to correct those few courts that have wrongly applied a much strict, stricter standard to hostile housing, school and workplaces cases. But by doing so, you in fact codify the severe or pervasive standard, which is completely the opposite of what this bill seeks to do. The intent of this bill is, not, is to address the going current standard of severe or pervasive because it is too high of a burden to bear. It is very dangerous to keep the word and in here because you would then be taking a position that what courts have done in the last so many years uh, it, in analyzing hostile environment cases um, and finding that those women that I talked about who had experienced a lot of hostility in the workplaces, you would be then taking a position that that is okay. 
that what has happened to women and minorities and people with disabilities and people in the LGBTQ community in workplaces, housing and schools is acceptable and therefore not actionable. So I just would remind us to go back to the intent of the bill, which is to clarify and address the going and current standard of severe or pervasive and not seek here to codify that instead. Um, a, several of us were able to put together a proposed amendment to this bill. And if I may uh, chair, can I share my screen? Um, sure, is she a co-host yet? No. Just a minute, we're gonna make you a co-host. Yes. All right, for so you now, co-host. Yep. Okay, let's see. Yep, great. Um, there we go. So I apologize that this was uh, provided so late, but um, it took a couple of tries. So these amendments are um, being presented by me, but they are on behalf of the Vermont chapter of the National Association of Social Workers, the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, and the National Women's Law Center. I also believe that if we had enough time that many of the witnesses who have already testified and supported this bill would also be signatories to this uh, proposed amendment as well. Um, so the first um, proposed amendment is that we get rid of that word and, as I mentioned, and insert the word or between severe or pervasive. And that should be done under the three areas of law here, both the uh, Fair Employment Practices Act, the Vermont Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act, and the harassment laws um, in education as well. We also propose that we delete the language uh, that says behavior that a reasonable employee with the same protected characteristics would consider to be a petty slight or trivial inconvenience shall not constitute unlawful harassment and discrimination pursuant to the section. Um, and the proposal is that we delete that so that we can borrow language that comes from the Virginia bill that many of us testified is actually much more uh, comprehensive and helpful to courts in uh, using a new standard if we are dismantling the severe or pervasive standard. Um, but before I get to that, I do want to say that uh, we want to also add verbal, written, visual, or physical conduct to the definitions of sexual harassment. The words substantially <clears throat> and the word performance should be deleted um, from the part of the statute with regards to the conduct or purpose or effect. Um, and the reason for that is that um, what courts have done is they look to see not just whether the behavior that is bad is in itself um, creates a hostile environment, they look to see the impact of that behavior on someone's educational outcome. They look to see whether that behavior has an impact on someone's performance at work. You can have someone who is subjected to a hostile work environment who is still performing well in the job. That does not make it okay that they are being subjected to hostility. You can have a kid in school who is being called derogatory words on a regular basis who is still getting A's in the classroom. That does not make it okay for that child to have to work that much harder to earn those A's. So when we remove substantially and we remove performance from both the definitions in, uh, under the um, Fair Employment Practices Act, as well as in our education laws and in our uh, public accommodations and fair housing laws, is that we take away courts looking to see what was the impact of the hostility on you and did you fail at school or did you fail on the job in order for us to find that you have a cognizable claim of hostile environment here. The language or, that- or may, I, or may I ask a question on that? Yes, please. And, and also, can you can you make the screen a little bit bigger, the text? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Let me try to do that. Is it? Okay. Just reload your. Re there we go. New. 
There you okay. go. That's great. Now I'm at 2020 now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Oh, oh no, wrong. <laughs> so the the words that are deleted here substantially in performance are you I mean I when I hear you talk about them I, I, I view them as um much more subjective is that is that fair I mean because it's it's leaving it up to the court it's leaving it up to the court to define what substantial or performance is and that's what I think we're aiming to correct here is that, I mean, that, that that's too loose because different opinions can mean, different people can mean different things. So the, the purpose of deleting substantially in performance, the plaintiff still has to show that what has happened to them had an effect and it interfered with their work and it created an intimidating, hostile and offensive work environment. They still have that burden. They still carry the burden of having to show that there was some type of interference and that it created an intimidating, intimidating environment. What we don't want is the courts to say, but, but how much did it interfere with your performance? Did you go from an A to a B? Did you go from an A to a D in the classroom? Or uh, did you not pass probation because of the hostility? That's what we're trying to avoid here is having court look at the impact on someone's work performance or the, the impact on someone's school performance. And, and courts had been doing that. And the goal here is to say that that sort of analysis is not necessarily the best or most appropriate analysis for determining the hostility that this individual has had to uh, go through in order to still achieve those same outcomes. Okay, Representative Parsons. Thank you. I just had a question at the beginning of that sentence there. Um, you're saying that it would, they'd have to show that they were substantial, you know, there's substantial interference with their work and, um, or their performance, but doesn't the first section of having the purpose of um, what, they wouldn't have to show that there was any substantial interference. There wouldn't even have to be any. It just that was the purpose of, right? Or my yeah, purpose or effect. So we have purpose or effect. So it can show that the purpose of is to interfere or the the effect of. But I think the key here is to get rid of the word substantially, so we don't have courts weighing how bad was it in terms of the outcome using the outcome of someone's performance in school or in work to determine how much of the interference that occurred. I just wanna say, we see a lot of cases at the Human Rights Commission where someone was still able to earn A's in the classroom, even though they were being called a derogatory racial slur or another term related to their disability on a regular basis. And we, what we are trying to avoid here is having courts go, well, you did well. So apparently it didn't substantially interfere with your, your uh, uh, school performance. But in reality, you cannot capture the fact that that kid worked that much harder to earn those A's in that classroom because of what they were going through. So that's the purpose of getting rid of substantially and getting rid of per performance here. They still carry the burden of showing that the conduct has the purpose or effect of interfering. But that the idea here is to get rid of the analysis that courts have been doing around outcomes. Representative Murphy has a question. Yes, thank you so much for being with us. And I know that your time is, is challenging to share out so I can understand um, looking at, and I have to admit, I've read ahead a little bit, but looking at what you're providing to us with um, a recommendation of amendments, but it amends three different uh, volumes of, of our statute. So, so we, um, and I'm new to the committee this season, so um, perhaps I'm speaking out of turn, but, but so now we're doing not just labor, but commerce and education with the amendments you're providing. So I, I'm just... I, I think it's noble to have the broad reach and to have this out here, but I'm just curious if, if this is your intention to, to broaden this and have it become a bigger discussion or if you're just offering us um, some thoughts. The original bill as introduced already seeks to amend all three areas. 
that my amendments or our amendments today really only s creates consistency uh, between all three areas. But while the majority of the witnesses that have testified before this committee were testifying on workplace uh, harassment, the reality is, is that the bill as introduced seeks to change the anti-discrimination laws across all three areas. Mm -hmm. My apologies, I see that. I, I oh, didn't good. scroll far enough on my, on my copy. You're right. And thank you for bringing that to light for me that I hadn't seen that. No problem. Like I said, again, I think a lot of uh, uh, witnesses were experts in the workplaces and that they testified to that. So the focus has been on that. But uh, you may remember that some of your original witnesses were also from Vermont Legal Aid and CVOEO. So uh, I'm not going to say it right. I'm not going to remember all of that. Right. But uh, Jess Hyman from CVOEO testified because they also support this in housing as well. And the Human Rights Commission has jurisdiction over all three areas, both um, the harassment laws and in the education uh, laws, as well as the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act and the Fair Employment Practices Act as it relates to government um, employees. Well, and I think there makes sense for there to be a commonality of harassment and how we look at it. I don't think it should depend on what silo you're in, whether you're being harassed or not. Um, and I would just say, it, I, I'm having a little trouble hearing you periodically too. So I don't know if your microphone can just be brought a little closer to you or if, if it's... Okay. I'll try my best. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, now you're clear. It's just, it was somehow how you were moving that I was losing you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I was going to say, nobody's ever had to tell me to speak up. So I... <laughs> It's new. It's new. Yeah. All right. Thank. Thank you for you. Can, let's 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 keep going. Okay. So the other proposed amendment here that I mentioned is lang instead of the trivial or slight uh, offenses, is that we adopt the language that comes from the Virginia bill, which I think is more comprehensive. And I'm happy to answer questions around it too. But here it is underlined and in bold. In determining whether conduct constitutes harassment as defined in this chapter, the following rules shall apply. A, a determination shall be made on the basis of the record as a whole, according to the totality of the circumstances, and a single incident may constitute harassment. B, incidents that may be harassment shall be considered in the aggregate with the conduct of varying types including expressions of sex-based hostility, requests for sexual favors, and denial of employment opportunities due to sexual orientation, viewed in totality rather than in isolation, and conduct based on multiple protected characteristics, including sex and race, viewed in totality rather than in isolation. Conduct may be workplace harassment regardless of whether the complaining party is the individual being harassed, the complaining party acquiesced or otherwise submitted to or participated in the conduct. Mm -hmm. The conduct is also experienced by others outside of the protected class involved. The complaining party was able to continue carrying out duties and responsibilities of the party's job. Despite the conduct, the conduct caused a tangible or psychological injury or the conduct occurred outside of the workplace. Okay, so these, this, what I, I believe creates a much more comprehensive list of factors for courts to use to analyze harassment than just simply suggesting that they not be trivial slights uh, or petty slights. Um, and this is important because what we do know is that courts have had trouble analyzing uh, hostile environment cases when a plaintiff belongs in intersectional identities. So in the past, when a woman is also a woman of color and she was subjected to racial slurs plus sexual innuendos, courts would isolate the analysis and say, well, those racial slurs occurred only a few times, not severe. And th that sexual innuendo only occurred a few times. That's also not severe or pervasive. This requires courts look at the totality of the circumstances, the big picture, and look at who is creating the hostility here, who is receiving the hostility here, and is it interfering with, um, or does it have the purpose or effect of interfering with their work or their housing or their uh, schooling? 
And so I think that this is really helpful to courts to set forth uh, a much clearer standard uh, for how to do that. Uh, You'll see here under section C, conduct may be workplace harassment regardless of whether, and it lists these factors because different courts have found different required additional factors that uh, creates a lot of confusion in terms of how to analyze it. Some courts have said, well, you need psychological injury. I need to see that you went to see a therapist and you know there's uh, damages connected to that. Or, um, oh, it didn't happen within the four corners of the building. And so therefore it's not, it's outside the workplace. Or we know that with kids, that harassment is happening on school buses. Harassment is happening on field trips. Harassment is happening on the field, off campus when they are playing games. We know that that is occurring. So we want to also capture the fact that harassment can be occurring in environments that are controlled by schools and housing providers and supervisors and managers, even if that conduct is not within the building specifically or the property adjacent to the building specifically. Uh, and then the rest of the amendments seek to do the same thing in the Fair Housing and Public Accommodations Act. You'll see here, we're asking that uh, we get rid of the word substantially as well, uh, borrow again from the Virginia law. And also same thing with um, uh, under the education harassment laws also. And um, so yes, that is uh, the um, some of the amendments that um, our group would like to propose to the committee. I know that there are a lot of other questions regarding other parts of the bill, uh, which of course to me are very important, but I wanted to make sure that we had enough time to talk about what I believe is the most important part of 329 and um, answer any questions that you may have about this or any other parts. Senator Murphy, then Hango. Thank you again. I, I appreciate the piece where you're removing the word performance. I think that especially when you look at the um, ed educational portion, but in any of them, it's um, it could have interfered with my ability, my, my experience, but I may have overcome it and performed just as well as anyone might expect. And so it's an outside uh, determination whether it was a problem as opposed to just a hurdle I had to get over. So. Thank you for bringing that forward. Thank you. Oh, and one, I do have one question because you said the other pieces. Would it be okay or do you want to finish sure. with this? Um, there was on JI on page three, the General Assembly finds that claims of unlawful discrimination, the whole piece about the summary judgment, we had several recommendations that we shouldn't be speaking there. Um, do you feel that it endangers anything by just removing that? Um, I don't, uh, let me say that that is a lesser priority for the Human Rights Commission. And if that's the thing that is the barrier to moving this bill forward, then um, I, I would understand uh, the, the committee's position on that. My feeling about that is that when you are creating a new legal standard, that you want to make sure that courts aren't still using this body of law that they've been using for years to say that the law is so clear and someone is entitled to win. The whole purpose of summary judgment is the law is so clear someone is entitled to win. Well, we're actually saying now the law is not clear. This is new. We're using a new standard here. And so it's not necessarily appropriate to move forward uh, uh, to, to grant summary judgment. And mind you, the, <clears throat> the pro, the piece here around summary judgment is not actually suggesting that uh, courts couldn't dis, uh, grant a motion for summary judgment. It's just saying we don't necessarily think that that's the best approach or most appropriate approach. Um, but I defer to you. I know that there was some um, arguments that seem to be um, compelling. Thank you. Representative Hango. Thank you. Section 221 BSA um, number 13A, which I believe Representative Murphy just referred to. I thought she was going to get this cleared up for me with her
question, but I don't think <laughs> she did. Um, so the, the phrase, the conduct has the purpose or effect of interfering with an individual's work mm -hmm. is problematic for me because I don't understand what exactly that could encompass. To me, that could encompass just about anything. And there again, the burden of proof would be on the person who is doing the harassment um, or the discriminatory behavior. And it is up to the victim or the alleged victim to tell, um, to say what effect it had of interfering with their work. And um, the, the alleged perpetrator would have to prove that they did not have an effect on their work. So that's problematic for me. So the burden of proof is always on the plaintiff. There are a few circumstances in laws that where the burden shifts back and forth, but the burden of proof in proving any kind of discrimination case, including a hostile environment case, is always on the plaintiff. They carry the burden. So they would have to show and prove that what they experienced interfered with their work. Uh, or had the purpose or effect of interfering with their work. So that could be a kid in middle school who said, I was called this uh, derogatory term uh, on a regular, mm -hmm. weekly, and I went home and I cried and I told my mom and my mom spent many hours at night working with me on my homework. And I, yeah, I still got an A, but it did impact me. And they would be testifying to that effect. And it would be up to a judge or a jury to decide whether that person is credible, whether what that person shared was true. Usually mom would probably testify as a witness to say that my kid did come home every night crying because they were called this derogatory term at school on a weekly basis, that this was happening to them. So the burden is still always on them and uh, they do carry that, that, that burden. Thank you. I think I used the wrong term by saying burden of proof. I was um, more thinking, actually, I was thinking at this from an adult's point of view, not a child's. Um, so you do bring up a good point when you talk about children in school being discriminated against. However, I was thinking of discrimination in the workplace and these are adults who can speak for themselves. Um, so I don't know, I still think it's, it's quite broad, but I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Representative Kalaki. Uh, Damien, are, are you able to join us at this as well? I'm right here. I, I, just want to, <laughs> I just want to make sure I understood, um, and I'm on page three of the bill, uh, line eight, and it's about the decision not to pursue an internal grievance or not being determinative. And Damien, did I understand correctly that you said currently the statutes are silent on this issue? This is, yeah, it's not currently addressed in statute. What this addresses is a, a defense that employers can uh, put forward against liability called the Farragher-Ellerth defense. Um, and this is the second prong of that defense, uh, which uh, in which if the employer can show the employee was un unreasonably uh, elected not to pursue uh, an internal grievance process, uh, the employer can succeed on that defense. So it's uh, the, the basis of the defense and both Julio and Bohr can probably state this much more accurately than I can. Um, but the basis of the defense is basically that the employer has an effective uh, has taken effective measures to prevent uh, discrimination from occurring, and then that the employee unreasonably failed to take advantage of the internal process for addressing the discrimination that occurred. So therefore, the employer shouldn't be liable for the discrimination that occurred. So it's basically um, what this does is it relates to that and it says that the failure to use that internal grievance process is not determinative. So, and I'd invite both Bohr and Julio who 
have far more experience in this area than me to uh, correct anything I may have misstated or to add additional detail. Well, I, I, I certainly would love to hear from both Julio and Bora. I was, I was intrigued with other testimony about this that you know some employees, employers are trying to do set up these systems to make them work and affect change in their organization. So I'm uh, wondering if we were silent on this particular issue, if for Bor or Yang, if that would weaken the bill or the intention of the bill. Again, I think this bill, uh, you know, brings up a lot of important parts and the most important is the severe or pervasive piece of it. But having said that, I think we did also hear testimony from several people that suggested that it can be incredibly difficult for an employee to exhaust that internal grievance process and unfair to require them to do so. This language in the bill comes from uh, New York City's statute and what it does is, and Damien, you did a really great job of explaining it, but what it does is it addresses an affirmative defense. And I want to clarify that there are defenses and then there are affirmative defenses. Affirmative defenses, when they're raised by a defendant, says you lose. You lose if I can show that this happened, that I had this grievance process and you didn't exhaust it. It feels like an automatic lose um, and so the idea here is, and why the language says not determinative is you may have that, but this lawsuit should still proceed. You may still present that information, but it shouldn't determine the outcome of uh, a, ha a harassment uh, claim. That's the idea. Okay, thank you. And Julio? Yeah, on, on this, um, you know, this language was brought brought from the 2019 New York law. Um, and by its terms, it's not limited to the affirmative defense in a supervisor case. And in my initial testimony, I raised the question of what, what, what effect, if any, that section about failure to participate in the complaint process, filing a complaint is part of the complaint process. What would happen in a coworker case where the conduct isn't witnessed and the employee doesn't complain, is the employer nonetheless liable, whereas under current law, they're not liable unless they knew about it and failed to take corrective action. <clears throat> so uh, I think I mentioned in my introductory testimony last time that I was making an effort to talk to the New York agency, that's our counterpart, the HRC's counterpart for New York State, which has been applying this law since 2019 to ask them what it meant. Uh, and I did have that conversation this week uh, with the general counsel for the New York State Commission on Human Rights, which is tasked with enforcing the law. And I put to them the same example I gave you. What if it's a coworker or a third party, like a, a customer at a restaurant who routinely harasses the wait staff, but it's not witnessed by the employer or a manager, and it's not reported to the employer what happens then? How, do, how would you apply the law then? And the answer I was, was a little surprising. The answer was, we don't know. We didn't write that language. No one asked us about it when they added it in, uh, in the law. Uh, I think, I don't know, I'm not sure if it was a joke or not, but saying that this law was passed at midnight with a flurry of, of amendments, uh, and they're not sure. Um, they have only had to apply it in the cases where there is a supervisor who engages in harassment, but no other action, like they don't reduce wages or increase wages or reassign somebody for which under the existing law, there is no affirmative defense. But they haven't had a case where a coworker or a third party is harassing a complainant and the only way the employer could find out about it, management could find out about it would be through a complaint. So they don't know, so they don't know. Uh, they haven't said whether, and, and they said it's too soon for, there haven't been cases that have gone to court on that fact pattern, because um, cases may resolve for other reasons unrelated to that legal issue. So, so I can't tell you what the scope of it is. I think that as it's written, uh, if it were applied to the coworker harasser or the third party har harasser, then it basically would be strict liability um, for 
uh, harassment that happens uh, on the, at least on the employer's premises and maybe off the employer's premises. Um, you could have guests who come into the establishment uh, and if the employer doesn't have an up, even if the employer, um, you know, credibly prevent, presents evidence that had they known they would have taken corrective action, if the law, it, it would be changed here to be um, uh, that you're liable nonetheless, and it's just a question of damages, then that would be a pretty significant change to tort law. There's nowhere I, I know in the United States that that's had or proposed strict liability. And, and uh, like I said, my counterparts in New York are not sure that's what was intended here. So the committee, and they're looking at this, may want to look at the context of the defeating that supervisor uh, exception, uh, that affirmative defense, as opposed to, to more broadly. Because I think you'd want to, I think if it's going to be strict liability, if that's what the legislature wants to do, they should just say it, that an employer is strictly liable for harassment by its, its employees or people who are on its premises rather than leaving, it, leaving the uncertainty for, for the parties there. So I'm sorry, that's an unsatisfactory answer from New York. I, I perceived, it wasn't stated, but I perceived that there was some dissatisfaction from New York about that language, or at least the enforcement agency about that as well. Um, New York City, um, uh, who had an ordinance, which from which a lot of the New York- I'm sorry. New York City, uh, it, their law from which much of which the New York state law was based, uh, didn't have that provision. Rather, the failure to participate or to report might doesn't affect liability, the same standards still apply, but might, uh, you know, wouldn't limit damages. Um, so it was a different formulation. So I think it's a bit of a question mark for us. I, I did have some comments about severe and pervasive, but maybe it's not the right time. I'll, I'll let the committee decide that. No, well, I think, um... No, I think Julio, let's consider that the baton has been passed to you and, okay. and um, go so, please. Okay, please. well, thank you. Um, so I, I haven't, the uh, Boar's memo, I, I, I didn't receive a copy, so I was just looking at it in real time on the screen like the rest of you. Uh, there are a number of things that um, Boar said that uh, I agree with would, would be sensible. I, I think a lot of the standards or language that she wants to put in I think describes the existing case law in Vermont and in the Second Circuit where Vermont resides. Um, it, it, to give an example, and I'm not sure what, what cases were, were being um, referenced, but like the factor, uh, to give one example, like putting in statute that, the in, that you don't need to suffer psychological harm in order to make a, a claim of, of hostile work environment harassment. Um, that's been the law uh, in the United States since 1993. Uh, in a decision, uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, then Justice O'Connor, wrote in a case called Harris versus Forklift, the employer's defense in that case was that the, the worker's failure to show psychological damage defeated her claim. Uh, and the Supreme Court uh, ruled in that case that one does not need to show psychological harm. Uh, I'm not aware of any case in Vermont at the Superior Court, Supreme Court, Labor Relations Board, District Court, or the Second Circuit that takes a contrary view. So uh, if, if the, the legislature wants to put it in a statute, I think that's fine. I mean, Harris was a Title VII case, and we do have Vermont Supreme Court precedent saying we look to Title VII cases for guidance because of our law is patterned after. It's not exact. It's not exact copy, but it's it's patterned after Title VII. So, from our enforcement position, we've never turned away a complaint for lack of showing psychological injury. I'd be surprised if the HRC ever has, uh, and I, I I'd be very surprised uh, if if a Vermont court did that. It would and it would and I. Not a fortune teller, um, but I, it would be hard for me to imagine the Vermont Supreme Court would come out to that result. So I, it's it's in the Virginia bill, um, but the law in Virginia and its circuit might be different, but um, I think it describes existing law uh, in, in uh, Vermont uh, in the second circuit. 
and, and certainly in federal courts, um, because that's, that's, the, that's the Harris case. Um, I don't have the language available to me uh, on, the, um, on the bill or, or the amendments in front of me, but in terms of substantial interference with work, um, I don't know if any, can anyone put it back on there? I think, I, I think there seemed to be, it seemed to me at least as I was hearing the testimony that there wasn't a recognition that the rest of the sentence is an or, um, that it said it has the purpose of effect of substantially interfering or uh, creating an intimidating, offensive and hostile environment. So as, as the law exists now, you don't have to show substantial interference. And, and indeed, as the law is written now, you don't have to show any interference, but you, have to, but you would have to go to the second part of the sentence and show that it was an intimidating, hostile, uh, and offensive work environment. So we in the CRU have never seen, a, we have never used as like the linchpin test, can you, can you prove that your work has gone down? That might be a factor in uh, assessing, but not a, certainly not a required factor. It might be a factor in determining what, you know, how offensive was it? How hostile was it to you? Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm not sure that uh, substituting substantially interfering or interfering uh, would have that much effect on the cases that we have. Uh, I would say substantially interfering, I mean, a little, it gets a little bit like angels on the head of a pen to, to an extent because um, even if everyone admits it didn't interfere with my work, the legal question still remains. Was it offensive? Was it hostile? Uh, was it intimidating? Notwithstanding that it wasn't substantially interfering. And, and I, our practice and I think Vermont courts, if they find the answer is yes to any of those three questions, you could still have liability, notwithstanding the lack of substantial interference. Um, so it's it it's not a requirement now. Uh, it's it's one of several doors that a complainant can go through. On the issue of the purpose or effect, in practice, that purpose, I'm not aware of any case where, and, and, and I, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing one, where the conduct had the purpose but zero effect and was still viewed as a violation of the law. That is, if I'm a, if I'm a, a harasser that isn't the brightest and I, and I'm hostile to a particular person in my office. And I think that, um, you know, that calling someone mediocre is the worst thing that you can call anybody because it was something I was called when I was a kid and it really hurt my feelings and I quit, you, whatever I quit. Uh, and then, so I tell someone, I, I call them mediocre and I have the purpose of creating a hostile work environment for them but it's undisputed that the person who heard it was not offended by it or thought it was petty, was not intimidated by it. I, I don't think we or the Human Rights Commission in that case would find that a, a, a blow that doesn't land, uh, an offensive letter that gets lost in the mail uh, is actionable if there is, there is actually no effect on the complainant. So, uh, it's a, it's a word in the statute that preexisted all of us, uh, I think, uh, here in, in the room in, in being involved with the bill, but um, I don't think it's particularly problematic in practice. So um, it, we, just, we just proceed and say, what kind of environment uh, was involved here? Um, one reason that you still need to focus on effect is a reason that no one's mentioned yet, which is that this is a government created sanction uh, and some of the conduct that's involved here is speech. And so whenever we look at speech, we always have to ask whether the speech is protected or not by the First Amendment or by the Vermont Constitution. Because not all, because, not, because a single utterance, there are certain political views uh, or religious views that can be uttered by workers in a discussion which might express views about equality that might prove offensive to other people. You could have at a company picnic, for example, someone who says, 
you know, who's new to the United States and says, well, where we come from, uh, women don't do manual labor. That's a gender-based statement uttered in the workplace. Um, it's, it, it has a gender, it has a gender slant to it, but it also might have a religious basis as well. Um, and constitutionally to, to, to punish someone or subject them to suit for making a statement with no kind of impact on anybody else would be, would be difficult. Um, the basis for regulating speech in the workplace comes from the legislature's constitutional authority to regulate business. And that harassment is a, is a form of interfering with someone's ability to participate in the economy. That's not what we haven't really focused on that, but that's really, that's where your authority comes from or Congress's authority to regulate interstate commerce. Uh, and so the question, the underlying question in a harassment case, and this will circle around to where I think Bohr and I are standing really closely together, uh, which is that it, the focus really is on whether the conduct is interfering with someone's right to enjoy their employment on equal terms with people who are not subject to the harassment. It's not about like how much you can take, how bad is bad and you can't take it any longer. Fundamentally, uh, the question is whether if we, let's use sexual harassment, is, is your female worker, uh, are they on the same footing with their male workers um, or are they on a lesser feeling? Is the job less welcoming, less comfortable um, to them? Uh, do they feel like they're equal partners, uh, notwithstanding whatever the conduct is? And that's why uh, it was appropriate, I think, in some of the language here to note that it's not necessarily sexualized like dirty talk or whatever, but it can also be hostility towards a particular group towards women uh, to use to keep with my example. So someone who expresses in their various different ways that women shouldn't drive big trucks in our organization and there's an expressed and there are various behaviors that show a hostility towards women working certain jobs. Um, comparing them to men who don't receive those comments or the rolled eyes or the cartoons or whatever it is, that's fundamentally what you're looking at. And I think some of the jurisprudence here has got caught up in this idea of like human endurance. How bad does it have to be before a human being gives up, can't take any longer? Um, and I think part of the focus on the severe and pervasive standard is a recognition that courts have focused more on that rather than on, are you enjoying, you know, we, we would all, we would all um, have no difficulty deciding a case if an employer had a policy that said in our, you know, our lakeside adjacent offices, all the inner offices, the ones without windows go to women and only the outer windows with the view of Lake Champlain in the mountains go to men. If that were the official policy, we would have very little difficulty saying that that is violation of the terms and conditions of employment because you have unequal treatment and it's not, you don't have to prove that you can't endure being work, working inside of an interior office. It's rather that you, the, the, your participation in the economy is different than people of the opposite gender because of your sex. And I think the idea of zeroing in on that, on workplace economy, uh, you know, is really an appropriate subject for, um, uh, for, for the committee to be discussing because really that's, that's your authority is to regulate the economy. Uh, and, um, and, that's when, and that's why you have to look at how it affects somebody's ability uh, to, to work. So I'll, I'll stop there. I've been talking for a while. Um, Representative Fango? I think I'm good, thank you. I would completely forgotten what I was going to ask Julio. Okay. Sorry. Nice. You got Phil bastard. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, any further questions right now for either Bohr or Julio? I just, Representative Parsons? One quick one was um, on the suggestions that um, Morgan had put up on the screen. One of them was about the, um, the not having to take place in the workplace, it said, what I think was the wording. That just seems, I think, that was taken from Virginia, maybe. Um, that just seems 
the language of it, I guess, problematic. I mean, I would imagine that the workplace is, you know, different for everybody. For my workplace, it's the shop, my van, somebody's house. That's all my workplace. I mean, and as far as the schools go, um, if the school is anywhere where the school system is in charge of the children, which is, you know, the bus is included, field trips are included, playgrounds included. Oh. Well, I, I think there's a couple things, and I, I, I'm not the, the expert here on, on education or public accommodations because the civil rights unit doesn't practice in that space. I will point out, I think Bohr made, and, and the Virginia legislation makes quite a good point that, especially in the digital age we are now, that connecting it to the brick and mortar institution, the employer's premises, I'm, 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 I'm talking to you from my house. I'm, this is the mudroom behind me. And so we, we routinely encounter cases where employers or coworkers are sending uh, obscene uh, text messages to subordinates or coworkers, uh, even though they may be in different states or countries. Uh, a, a, a teacher sending lewd texts while he's on vacation in Venice to a student that is in Rutland uh, is still gonna have an effect on that student's educational opportunities, notwithstanding the fact that they're thousands of miles away. So I, I think the existing case law recognizes uh, you know, that there still has to be a connection to your institution because that's what you're regulating mm -hmm. is an equal workplace or equal job or school or enjoyment of a public accommodation. So merely saying that it doesn't have to be on your brick and mortar, I, th I mean, I think that's existing law and codifying it, I, I don't think is an issue at all. But um, there is, I think courts are be able to distinguish uh, examples that, that have come up where a co an employee sees another worker doing something at a mass sports event. You know, uh, there have been cases where people have removed parts of their clothing, uh, you know, hundreds of yards away with their group of friends at a sports event and is seen by a coworker uh, who then becomes uncomfortable. Uh, you would, courts would say you need to show more connection that it was directed at you, that it had some effect on you rather than being some happenstance where someone's employed in public doing something that made you feel uncomfortable. So merely saying that it doesn't have to be on your premises, I think, uh, I, I, I certainly don't think that increases risk or problems to the employers. And I, I think it's, a, it's helpful. It's very likely descriptive of, of the law that's existed in Vermont all the time. And so it wouldn't be something that I think, th there are other issues here for the, for the committee, I think, to have questions about. I don't consider that like a significant one. I'd be surprised if you heard employers say otherwise. Okay, yeah, that was just one thing that seemed odd. I mean, if it's, yeah. Representative Clackie. Uh, Julio, I, I know uh, Representative Murphy had asked more about the summary judgment component, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on that piece of the bill. Uh, I, I think I'm with Bohr here. As she said before, I don't think it's a very important point. Uh, putting aside, I mean, there are rules about the standards for when to decide summary judgment in civil cases under Rule 56 of the Vermont Rules of Civil Procedure, which are put out by the judiciary. Supreme Court decides what the standard is and puts it in that rule. Uh, so there's, you know, there's kind of an interesting academic discussion about separation of powers and whether uh, legislature, you know, they can they can say when judges should apply their own rule, their own standard. Uh, and it also there's a practical question of if, you know, many Superior Court judges might get four employment cases a year, and so how a judge is supposed to decide in a given case. I sh whether it should be rare. So like I, I decided summary judgment in a different case. And now if I do two in a year, is that rare enough? So I'm not really sure um, articulating it in that matter really, do really does much at all. It it'd be, you may wanna hear from Judge Zoni or others in the judiciary about that. Um, uh, you know, there are other ways, there are other aspects that, that may be legislated like who has the burden of proof whether a given issue is a question of fact 
versus a question of law. So questions of law go to judges, questions of fact go to juries. And then there's something called a mixed question of fact and law, which a judge may be able to decide in some circumstances and some circumstances it gets kicked over to juries. But I, you know, I think as it's written now, I'm not sure how it would affect judicial behavior because I'm not sure it's sufficiently concrete for judges to make much sense of that. The, the general, I mean, the standard is if your facts are not disputed, if the facts before the judge are not disputed and the law says those facts are not sufficient, um, then you decide for the defendant. If they are sufficient, you decide for the plaintiff. Um, and so to say it should be rarely applied seems to be, I'm not sure how that, that helps a judge. The judge is gonna, do we have a factual dispute or not? In cases in, in harassment, facts are often disputed. Um, you said this, no, I didn't. That's a jury question. Um, this, this created an intimidating environment for me. Um, we, we disagree, that's a jury question. So I'm not sure it really does a whole lot. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think having it in would likely affect things, judges might disagree and I don't think having it out um, weakens it if, if you're gonna advance the other things that you're gonna do here. So I, I agree with Gore, I don't think it's the biggest it's the biggest aspect. Thank you. So, sure. Well, thank you, Bor, and thank you, Julio, for your time and for your for your um, testimony on this. Thank you for providing us with these amendments for us to consider. Um, truly appreciate that. Um, Katie, we're going to take a five minute break, and then we're going to move over to H two forty four. Again, Julio and Bor, thank you so much. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Good seeing you all. Thank you, Bor. Thanks, uh, Damien.